Next session will be AJ Towns about debugs. So please welcome with me the, don't worry this time, I will make it right, the non-member of the non-existing non-couple team. Whether to be a cabal, I'd be a hypothetical member. Okay, so these slides were prepared at um, about midnight last night, going on till about 1, 2 a.m. So if there's any bugs in them that you see, then feel free to point them out. Uh, there isn't a pseudo package for the talk, no. Okay, so everyone here has used debugs, right? Hands up if you haven't used debugs. Wow. Okay. Um, also, hands up if you've read the, the debug section in the proceedings. Okay, that's kind of um, background material that you'll need for the second half. So during the little break, if you <laughs> don't have anything better to do, I'd suggest you, rec you read that. Okay. So debugs is the Debian bug tracking system, duh. Um, it obviously has a, a web interface and it has an email interface. The web interface is obviously the main thing you use to actually read bugs most of the time. Um, how many people just use the mail interface and not the web? So you get mail about your packages but never look it up on the web or never look anyone else's package or your bugs up on the web, you just use your email client. Anyone? Wow, okay. So the web interface is pretty important for most people except for obviously one or two. And it has some particular requirements. So if the website goes down, then it becomes very, very difficult to actually do any Debian work because you can't look up bugs. There's um, very limited mirroring of the, of the website these days. And formerly it used to be a bunch of static pages. So that was kind of for reliability. Is Ian Jackson in the audience? Excellent. Um, Okay, so the static pages worked really well and were mirrored in a few places, but that became a problem when it kind of was taking over 24 hours to regenerate the static pages. Um, B. Dale, if Ian Jackson tries to walk in, can you please block him? <laughs> Crap. Crap. Okay, so Ian Jackson's obviously the original author of Dead Bugs, and um, he hasn't been working on it for ages, so if I say... Uh, yeah, if you want to sit outside, that'd be great. Um, okay, so the website's kind of important. It has to be always available. It has to be fairly responsive. And it has to, one of the things with, and there are various sort of things on presentation of the information. So it's kind of useful to have the information actually presented in, in the order it came in rather than blog order. And yeah, okay, we've got an audience reaction shot of B-Dale. Smile for the camera. Okay, so what do people actually think of the, of the CGI scripts and the web interface at the moment? Reasonable, really crap? Really crap, really crap. <laughs> okay, can, if, you, if the answer is really crap, can I get a slightly more detailed response? Yep? But I think uh, the, okay. Uh, for example, the interlinking between the sites is uh, somewhat, um, Limited. So, uh, if you want to go from one uh, from, from one side to the other, you have to go to various clicks or remember the link or something like that. But uh, I guess the information is there, that, so that's not a problem. But uh, I guess uh, yeah, the interface f to find the site or to go from side one side to another that's pretty much limited, I think. You want to pass the microphone behind you too? Okay, so I, I kind of want to relativate this. I, I love that bugs, I really do. I think it's the best bug tracking system. I like working with it. So um, one of the, the, the issues, the only issues that I have with the web interface is that the information gets presented in order, as you said, but it has all the control information, all the headers um, directly available to everyone, and it's not threaded. So when there's you know these bugs that just keep on going for months, it's basically impossible to find information or find a, a trail of discussion within. So that's my main beef. Okay, we'll just take a couple more of the website complaints. Uh, 
Package info.cgi takes too long to run. Taking package report.cgi or package uh, index? Package report.cgi. Yeah. It takes about 10 CPU seconds. And certain users that uh, basically do a denial of service <laughs> attack on, on the web, uh, on so Spore. You com you're complaining how long package report CGI takes as the X maintainer walks in. That's very good timing. <laughs> He knows where I was. OK, so I'll actually respond to the, the timing thing. There are index files that are meant to speed it up, but they haven't been generated since we moved to Spore, and no one noticed for about a year. So, um, OK, and so there's obviously also the email interface. The email interface is the control interface. Website, it, the website is just for actually kind of read only. Um, the email interface has to be very easy to use. It has to be if you're trying to set up a Debian system and it's not working and the only thing you've got is a crappy Windows box that's just got Telnet that you can Telnet to an SMTP port, you still need to be able to file bugs. Um, the, the actual changes you make via email need to be reflected on the website fairly quickly these days. In the past, that used to take basically 24 hours to be reflected on the website. That wasn't really acceptable then, and it's certainly not acceptable now. And the email interface also needs to provide a fair bit of information on kind of what was changed, because there's no authentication in debugs, so the only way you can correct screw-ups is by basically seeing, yeah, this is Brandon's big kind of issue with debugs. He likes to relax item potency. You filed a bug with a patch that that makes debugs report all the, the control bot report all the previous state. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was just making sure that Anthony knew that I have filed a bug with a patch that as far as I can tell from reading the code does actually have the control bot report all, cha all previous state information when you are changing things via the, c the control interface. Because, you know, Anthony was kindly pointing out bugs that have gone unfixed for a long time in one of his previous talks. <laughs> Uh, there are many bugs in debugs that have gone unfixed for quite a while. One of them will be fixed during this talk. Um, actually, two of them, my mistake. By you? One by me, one by Joey, but kind of put on debugs by me. And technically, it was before this talk. I wasn't quite that game. Um, and yeah, the, the, so the issue with debugs is it isn't kind of technically maintained at the moment and hasn't been for a while. So. I joined when I hacked up some CGI scripts and kind of they got put on the website before they were rewritten to be secure and haven't kind of been rewritten to be secure, but they seem okay. It's great. Um, Colin kind of got roped in when he was kind of a newbie developer and was all excited about suddenly joining this really great project of, of Debian and important and gosh, how will I cope? How will I cope? And now he's a release manager, the sucker. Um, <laughs> And yeah, we kind of don't have anyone kind of leading the charge of debugs improvement at the moment. So bugs kind of linger unless they're really breaking stuff and kind of stopping development. So there are a few things like that. And if people start feeling really excited about this and kind of getting some momentum for debugs development, that could be really good. So one of the things that I don't think I put a slide up is that debugs is really good for Debian and really crap for just about everything else. So it's very hooked into the package, into the package orientation that, Debi that Debian uses. Um, a lot of places can't really use a package breakup. So GNOME and KDE were trying debugs for a while, and there were other problems as well with it. But just splitting on package isn't really enough for many things. But it does work really well for Debian because we have, for most packages, a reasonable number of bugs per package, and Amongst all our bugs, they're divided relatively equally between packages. And obviously, we ha um, is everyone familiar with all those different ways of sorting bugs? So by submitter, by source package, by maintainer, and in theory, also by severity and tag? You are now. That's really great. Um, yeah, why only in theory? It, it actually does. I'm sorry, why, why only in theory? That does seem to actually work, I think. Um, it does work, but there are lots of bugs with any particular tag. So it'll work fine for DI, I guess. It won't work so fine for 
all the bugs with patches in the Debian bug tracking system because there are just too many. Um, and likewise for severity, there are just too many for it to actually be usable. Um, and one of the key things is that finding, like collating interesting bug reports is really kind of a hard and it's kind of the key problem in the bug tracking system world. Um, and so if you come up with good ideas for that, that's kind of one of the better ways that you can contribute to debugs, even if it's just this is a really, this is a possible way of doing things that would be really useful. One of the similar sorts of things is like being able to prioritize um, bugs in a package. So sure, you've got these ones are serious, these ones are wish list, these ones are important, whatever. But maybe some of the wish list ones really are the highest priority for the, for the package. But there's no real way to reflect that in debugs. Um, that's something I've been thinking about for a while, but haven't really come up with a good way of dealing with it. Um, I'll get on to a kind of hack that might sort of work, but um, a little bit later. Okay, so one of the other things about the bug tracking system is that it's entirely public. So that's kind of defined in the social contract in the we will not hide problems section, which kind of talks exclusively about the bug tracking system and says, issue reports that go to the bug tracking system, they'll be up on the web page and they'll be public to everyone and it'll all be great. That's kind of meant that we don't really track security issues, certainly not in the bug tracking system, and apart from Joey's work, kind of not at all. And it's questionable whether that's the greatest thing, but it's a lot easier not to implement stuff, so if the social contract suggests that we shouldn't implement it, then that's just really easy. Yep? My question is, isn't that true only for security issues that are embargoed? Because there have been yes. plenty of ones that just got sprung on us, like with X386. Yes. That we do track via the BTS. Yes, so there are obviously are two sorts of security issues. The embargoed ones that go via the private lists and get fixed and then announced and uploaded all at the same time. And then there are the general ones that are just bug reports that are public disclosure right from the word go, put straight in the bug tracking system and fixed that way. And there's obviously the security tag to kind of track those. Um, one of the things that means though is that if you've got some security bugs that are tracked and a bunch that aren't, then you can't kind of do statistics on them. You can't do the release critical bug report. You can't say, oh, look at all these bugs. Sure, some of them we couldn't disclose a while ago, but now we can and we can show that it was fixed in a timely fashion or it wasn't fixed in a timely fashion and there's a problem here or whatever else. Um, and there are obviously other follow-ons like that from that. So should email addresses be made public? A lot of people who file bugs to help Debian don't really want their address made public so that they can be spammed forever. And obviously the header stuff, sometimes some of that's private. And the other question is, should the bug tracking system be Googleable? At the moment it isn't because the Google CGI scripts were DOSing master a while ago. And obviously be really good and really good for people's Google juice if the bug tracking system was Googleable. So there are kind of some balances there too. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, you want to wait for the microphone. I do quite a bit of uh, installation report processing, and it would be really great if you could search within only installation reports for certain issues like with serial ATA or whatever. So uh, you don't really want to search over the whole BTS sometimes, but only within uh, a certain subsection. Do you mean a full text search? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, full text search is kind of, kind of difficult because debugs isn't set up so that you can full text search very easily and it hasn't been implemented. But after you've heard this talk, obviously you'll be able to implement it and it will all be great. Okay. So the bug tracking system has to be responsive and reliable. It can't go down because that kind of screws up everything about Debian development. And it has to be responsive, otherwise you get the DI cron daily sort of problem where you're trying to do stuff, then you're waiting for stuff to load and update, and then you do some more stuff, and then you wait some more, 
and you're trying to communicate with people, but DevBugs isn't being responsive, so isn't sending them mail, and then they have to go to sleep because they're on a different wake cycle to you, and whatever else. So it has to always be available, it has to be responsive, and that means that changes to it need to be made very carefully. Um, you can, like, you can set up, obviously, a backup debugs thing with your own bugs that you test yourself. But when you roll out changes to, to master, then there are various different settings for that, and you just need to make sure that they work. One of the really fortunate things is that the email interface for changes um, leads people to expect some lag because the mail queue isn't run immediately, so there are general mail delays from maybe your ISP as well. So if you don't get an immediate response, people kind of accept that. So how many people noticed the bug tracking system was down for a couple of hours yesterday? There you go, three people out of all of you. Um, so the bug tracking system was down for a few hours yesterday because I was putting some of the new features in the second half of the talk in. Um, and the web interface keeps working so you can kind of do development. Um, bugs just get spooled so as soon as it gets re-enabled again, a couple of hours later because I forgot to re-enable it. <laughs> um, then they all just get spooled and everything goes out. And that actually works really, really amazingly well. Um, actually making the web interface allow changes would make that very difficult. Um, it would like lead to the expectation that you just click, you get an immediate response because that's what the web's about. And yeah, that's, that's one benefit of the email interface. I mean, uh, a contrary thing is that um, with an email interface, if you uh, start replying to bots that also start replying back, you get wonderful loops. Those are awesome. And even if you have the precedence junk and all the other crap that tries to avoid loops like that, it doesn't always work. One of the other cool things about debugs is there's a 15 minute delay between actually respond, receiving the email and responding to it, which kind of makes the loop not actually denial of service the box. Uh, one problem in the current thing is sometimes uh, peaks of spam cause five hour delays in processing when, when we get a 50,000. <laughs> yeah, so spam is a real problem for debugs. I mean, not only just publishing addresses, but having X, uh, what, 300,000 email addresses that have been published around the web, fairly well known, fairly easily guessable, like six characters long. Um, leads to getting a lot of spam. Um, we've got Cross Assassin, we've got Spam Assassin, we've got about 400 gigabytes of saved spam over the last year. And yeah, it's a real problem. Like it does, it, it is probably the biggest load that the bug tracking system puts on its host these days. And it kind of works, but yeah, spam's horrible. Um, but the, 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 the problem with that is we can't really fix spam because we want it to be very easy to send mail. We want it to not require authentication. We don't want to have to subscribe to bugs. We don't want to make it difficult to communicate. And so yeah, there's a pretty difficult trade-off there. Um, does every, hmm, I'm not sure I should advertise this, but does everyone know that you can kind of main mail owner at bugs and get spam removed from bug reports relatively easily? You can, I don't do any of that because it's boring. AJ? So the other thing about Deb, sorry? I just wanted to um, raise another point, and if I slept for a couple seconds, you actually said that, then please slap me. But um, one of the great things about the email interface for me, is, and I'm sure it applies to others, is that I'm traveling a lot, and I do Debian development, and I can just file bugs right on the train without any connection, and you know, with Bugzilla, yep. that's just impossible. Yep. And yes, we had a, at the Ubuntu Down Under meeting, um, Colin and I talked to the Malone Launchpad guys and tried to convince them to do a good email interface too. In theory they will, but it will require GPG apparently. Okay, so the other thing about debugs is it's very big. It deals with a lot of data. So 300,000 bugs, 50,000 or 60,000 at the moment that are active and can be modified and played with. Um, thousands of messages a day, hundreds of release critical bugs, whatever else. And obviously lots of queries while people actually look at those bugs. So, I mean, obviously there were issues in the past where the static generation of the, of the bug pages was taking way too long. It was just not updating before the next update needed to start. 
And there are similar things. So I'll get onto this in a minute, but the structure of the debugs database is basically a file is basically a file system. So there are four files per bug. And how many people have dealt with dealt with like two hundred thousand files in a single directory? It's not fun. And so we've had to deal we've had to do some hashing of that and obviously the archive bugs, three hundred thousand bugs by four files each, not pretty. And so I mean, there are, there, are th there are scalability issues with that. So you've got to have some sort of indexes that actually make it reasonably efficient to search. You've got to have the bug tracking system be responsive again. And so there are issues with that too. Yep. I don't want to start a religious war, but what's the file system? Um, I think it's just X3 now. Um, it became much better with the um, 2.4, I think, um, de-entry caching, the improvements to the VFS in 2.4, it suddenly became much better and it was wonderful. But yeah, we do hashing, so it's reasonably decent now anyway. Okay. So, it's a file system based, it's a, it's, it's, the database is in the file system. So there are just files per bug, there's a couple of index sort of files, and that's about it. And that means it doesn't require any complicated kind of database -y stuff. There's no SQL in it, which is not bad. And the database is basically split into two sections, which is the active bugs and the archived bugs. The difference between them is the archived bugs can't be touched at all. So if you mail them, it'll just say no such address. If you try and control them to reopen them, it'll also say no such thing. The um, debugs admins can basically reactivate a bug, but you're better off just filing a new one. And obviously, all the bugs are available via the web interface. Okay, so the hash of the the hashing of the bugs is just by the last two digits. So the directory structures, um, orgs, bugs.debmin.orgs, bool, db h zero zero three zero one five hundred dot log dot status dot summary and dot report. And they're all text files, so they're asyncable. They're like readable in v they're editable in VI. They're relatively understandable. Has, who here has looked at the log file format? Congratulations for still living. <laughs> okay. So, um, how many people have looked at the status file? And how many people of those haven't looked at the summary file? Very good. Summary file is the new, way, the new way of recording the basic kind of status information about a bug. So the, um, there's an example there, obviously. So there's the topic of the bug, there's the package it's assigned to, there's the message ID that opened it, severity, the date it was filed, basically that sort of information. And it's now in dpackage format. It used to be in this 10-line format that had each line number being some particular thing, and it was horrible. There was an unused keywords line. That's where tags came in. Um, apart from that, you couldn't add any features at all that required any sort of summary, any sort of status information changes. Um, Colin Watson has very creatively implemented a nice RFC 822 format, which is obviously extensible, just like everything else in Debian, and that's the way we're going now. Okay, this is the log file format. Do you like the control characters? Do you like the um? the hard-coded HTML. That's um, why debugs isn't translated. Um, those hard-coded HTML things differ between really old bugs and current bugs because the code in debugs changed to um, have nicer HTML output. The control codes in there, the control F, control C, control B, the control D in the middle of the line um, basically implement a state machine. The control D is like a kind of hard-coded comma to separate different email addresses. The other ones just tell you what sort of text follows. Um, there's kind of a summary of this in the, in the proceedings notes, but you kind of pretty much have to just look at the code to try and understand it. It's really quite horrible. It really should change at some point. Okay. There are the two other files that make up the four files per bug are the status and the report. The status is out of date. It's not 
really hopefully used anymore. It just contains redundant information from the summary file now. And there's also the report file. It basically just has the original, the original bug report, the original email that opened the bug report. And it's just basically used so that the original email can be included in the done message. OK, we've also got, um, for the CGI script, some index files. Because you don't want to basically be opening 50,000 status files or 300,000 status files to see which bugs are relevant for just one particular package that might only have two bugs open anyway. Um, yeah, this was never actually meant to go on bugs.debian.org. This was my quick hack to kind of make things work. Debian's really good at making quick hacks kind of stick around for years. Um, so yeah, basically that's the, that's the format. It's just a text file. It's one line per bug. It's got the package. It's got the bug number. You'll notice how Ian Jackson's bugs never get fixed. <laughs> Those are bugs filed by Ian Jackson, not in packages he maintains. Well, some of them might be packages he maintains or maintained, I don't know. Um, it's got the, the date that the bug was filed. It's got the status, whether it was open, forward, or closed. It's got the submitter. It's got the severity, and it's got the tags. Um, that's kind of kludgy to parse because the brackets could have spaces or more brackets inside them or whatever else, but it works well enough. Now, obviously, that's like a fairly long file. I think it's about a megabyte or so for the active bugs and probably about three megabytes for the archive bugs. And in theory, that ought to be really crap to try and parse, but apparently our hardware is fast enough now that for most things, obviously for some things you do notice it, but for most things you don't. There was meant to be a, um, a, D, uh, um, a DB format um, index where you could just constant time say, give me all the bugs for this package, give me all the bugs for this submitter, um, give me all the bugs for this severity, and give me all the bugs for these tags. That um, didn't actually make it when we moved the bug tracking system across to Spore because kind of they were being generated by a script in my home directory. Um, and yeah, so all the supports in the CGI scripts to read from them, but they're just not being generated anymore. They probably should be because there are obviously a much easier way to parse things. Um, the key, so there are two uses for this. One's for the CGI scripts to just grep through, look for the TWM package and just grab each of the bug numbers. And then you can open the summary files for each of those and get all the real information you want. Um, the other use is for kind of just general hacking on it. It's a, very, it's a very convenient kind of summary of most of the information you might want to grep through. So if you want to see what's the average number of bugs per package, you can just grep through, run it through sort, unique, some walk or whatever else, and work it out. Um, has anyone here not logged on to Merkel? Um, who's a developer? OK, Merkle's a really great little thing because it has mirrors of the stuff that you can't actually SSH to and log into because they're restricted machines. So there's a mirror of most of the bugs.debian.org on that machine, obviously except for the 200 gigabytes of save spam. I should note that the 200 gigabytes includes both gzipped and uncompressed copies of all the spam. Not anymore. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so yeah, if you want to just do some kind of statistical or if you want to hack up some stuff for the debug stuff, going onto Merkle, having a look through the index.db files is a useful sort of thing to do. OK, any questions so far? Sweet. OK. Who's here? Who? Oh, sorry? Um, one thing I thought would be uh, a useful thing to have in the bug tracking system, and I might even uh, uh, try and work on it sometime soon, is uh, RSS feeds for each bug. But how hard would that be to add into the current framework? Because I think we can already generate like a, an inbox for each bug. So would it be fairly easy to just have, you know, a simple uh, 
XML-based file generated for each bug? Okay, so um, the way the way that the bug report stuff is generated is with bug report.cgi, which you see in all your URLs probably. Um, it basically scans through the log file and then dumps some HTML for it. A lot of the HTML in that is hard coded, so it would be fairly simple either making a new um, RSS bug RSS report or something CGI script or actually parameterizing the HTML, the HTML or RSS HTML output. Um, so if you just change bug report, make a new CGI script and have it work, it should be fairly easy. If you want to actually make it just an option like and RSS equals yes or something like that, relatively easy, but you have to do the parameterization work, which is useful to do anyway. Um, there have been other there have been other sort of proposals for nicer CSS for the bug pages, which haven't been implemented because basically it's not parameter parameterized. So that would be a useful thing, and it wouldn't be very difficult. Um, it would basically be hacking on one Perl script. Okay, so one of the one who here knows of bug scan. Okay, you have to have kind of poked around a little bit to have found bug scan. It's the thing that generates the release critical bug report page. It also used to be the thing in my home directory that created the old. Has everyone has anyone here not seen the um, old bug graph or the um, non wish list bug graph that kind of stopped being updated a year ago? Um, so it's the thing that generates those sort of statistics. They're separate scripts. They just kind of parse through all the summary or status files and make up statistics, pipe it through GNU plot, whatever else. And that's kind of a really useful sort of framework for kind of hacking on stuff. It doesn't actually involve any special permissions. You just go through the spool on Merkle. You only need to read stuff. You just go through every summary file. You parse it appropriately, and then you do stuff with the information you get. Um, so yeah, if you want a kind of gentle introduction, then that's another good way of doing it. And obviously, the release critical bug page is kind of useful. The graphs are kind of interesting. So it's something you can do useful stuff with. Um, I'm not sure if the bug scan code is for the release critical stuff is available on Merkle. Because uh, he had. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the basic problem with bug scan is that uh, if you that it it was developed uh, yeah not very openly so uh, it was just a hack I guess at the beginning and uh, so and when I is. when I ha hacked some uh, bi little bit on it to improve it um, then it was basically to get. Uh, Colin to apply the patch and to prod him over ISC. That's a very common thing to do with yep. him. But um, um, the yeah, the problem is there is no C for C for, uh, no VCS or something for that. Uh, and that's I think that's basically the the cause for the alternative SC bug list by um, Andreas Barth. Um, so perhaps we could approve that and merge the two patches together again. Yeah. So. Um, bug scan up until oh, a little while ago now was running once in Wicket in Wicket's directory and once in my directory with kind of some historically shared code, but that's about it. Um, Wicket's after the release of critical bug page was down for a while, got merged into the bug practicing system proper um, by not being in the CVS or anything like that at all. And yeah, it's kind of a hack, so. If you feel like you want to kind of take over something without asking permission or anything, that would be a good thing to do and would not actually cause as many flame wars as you might hope. Um, and yeah, I mean, actually doing statistics on the bug tracking system is kind of something that is really lacking in the Debian bug tracking system sort of environment. Okay, who here was at Oslo 2003? Do you remember the bug squashing claim stuff? Yeah, so the claim stuff was a thing I hacked up for the Oslo stuff so that we could kind of track 
which RC bugs everyone was working on. Um, so that like we could coordinate it and didn't need to worry about changing the topic on an IRC channel or whatever else. And the idea behind that was that you don't want to always have to change bugs.debian.org itself to add new tags. So if a few people want to get together and kind of coordinate, um, these bugs are interesting for this reason, these bugs are interesting for that reason, but they're only interesting to us. They're not interesting to the world in, at large. And we don't want to bother people. We don't want to wait for the owner at bugs to delete all less spam and actually notice our message or wait a year for a patch to be accepted or whatever else. And so the idea behind that is kind of if you just make package report.cgi accept a list of bugs that are interesting, then that list of bugs can be generated by some other script that looks at, I don't know, some sort of PHP inputty thing or whatever else. Um, that didn't really um, build up to my satisfaction and basically just ended up being some scripts on master that developers could log into master, edit some file that they owned in some kind of slash temp sort of directory. And then they could do a query on the claims.cgi thing to see which bugs are being claimed by which developer. And that worked fairly well. So the list of bugs is just a post, uh, HTTP, HTTP post, and it's all kind of automated through the claims.cgi. And so it didn't really get used much beyond, beyond Oslo because the editing files that are owned by other people on master doesn't work very well. And so if you want to use the, the interface, you have to use package report dash aj.cgi, which probably no, no longer works anyway. And it's kind of, in theory, a good way of doing things, but there wasn't any take up. So maybe that means it was actually a crap idea, or it needs to be modified some more, or maybe someone just needs to work on the actual original interface, which isn't something I really am very interested in. OK. In theory, though, actually being able to say, um, have a small group of people, maybe in the same area or maybe just in a sub-project, say that these bugs are interesting for this reason is one of the good ways of being able to say that these are the interesting bugs. I don't want to have to scroll through the entire bug list for X just to find out which ones are about the hardware support for this particular computer that I'm interested in. And getting that sort of information out of the bugs, cabal, control, whatever like that, is kind of very helpful for everyone because you can do it much faster and we don't have any more work. So that's obviously a thing that can be worked on a bit. And yep, timing's great. So missing features. This is where we can have some more complaints if you like. Um, one of the obvious things is that the integration with upstream and downstream bug tracking systems is kind of pretty weak. There's the forwarded address, which you can send to an e which you can set to an email or set to a web page. That's about it. You can't get kind of automatic notification or kind of automatic integration if it's fixed upstream. Uh, you can't really do anything very special with stuff that's downstream. Probably you should. There's obviously a lot of spam prevention features that are missing, um, kind of hiding email addresses from random spiders that are crawling over the web. There's the actual avoiding getting spam in the bug logs that just sit there for years and years and years. Um, that's kind of a difficult problem. We don't really have any good solutions. We're just kind of throwing CPU power and spam assassin at it and hoping. Um, you can always basically have finer grain selection and control of bugs. So one of the features that I think got implemented was the owner stuff. Yes. So um, one of the features that some of the HP guys filed a patch for a little while ago was some um, was being able to assign a bug to an owner. So rather than just the maintainer of the package having to deal with all the bugs, you could set the owner of a particular bug to someone who'd take responsibility for it. And then I believe you can do queries on it and stuff as well. And I mean, there are always better things you can do with that. So just kind of limiting bugs, selecting by tags, selecting by subject header, stuff like that. There's always more improvements there. Um, secrecy and authentication, that bugs has none of that. So Obviously, there are lots of things that could be added if we wanted to. Um, adding secrecy, kind of a bad thing, like having all the bugs be public all the time is really helpful. It avoids you kind of saying, 
oh, this is kind of embarrassing. I don't want to talk about this. Oh, what can I do? What can I do? You just file it in the bug tracking system. You know about it. If you're embarrassed, too bad. Fix it quicker. Um, authentication stuff. We don't authenticate anything at all, basically. If someone was going to try and screw us up by closing every single open bug, they could do that. I find it really kind of surprising that we haven't had any attacks like that except from people trying to be helpful. <laughs> um, he actually fixes bugs. I don't have a problem with that. So the question is, what about Lamont? <laughs> I think that's a very valid question. I'm not sure it's necessarily particularly valid in response to bugs. No, I was just referring to the incident of him carving his name into the um, bug graph. Yes, that was, that was probably the release critical bug graph, which wasn't 10,000, but probably only a couple of hundred. Um, yeah, everyone knows the rule that if you're going to file like a bunch of bugs on a similar topic, you kind of talk to people on Devel or at least on IRC or something first. Everyone knows that, right? In their heart. Like in their soul, it's kind of engraved into their forehead and you look in a mirror before doing anything with a bug tracking system, I hope. Yeah. So one of the things with that is that often instead of filing 100 bugs, you can just kind of collate them and file them in one particular package. Or you can write a Lintian or Linda check, which I'm sure you'll hear about later today. And if you don't have, if you just can fix one bug, that's a lot better than having to deal with 100 bugs. So. That's kind of the attitude there with that. OK, anyone want to add to this slide? Yep. Um, wait for the microphone. Yeah, a couple of quick things. Uh, one would be something better than CVS so that we can have uh, easier contribution of patches. Because right now, I personally have probably close to 300 lines of patches, both modularizing a bunch of things. And in order to get those sorts of patches into the BTS, it's almost impossible when dealing with CVS. I mean, Subversion is a step better, maybe Arc, Baz, Darks, whatever, but something better so that the uh, somebody who doesn't have commit access isn't a second-class citizen. Um, what was else I was going to ask about? Uh, oh. So that would be something that would be uh, really helpful. Um, oh, and the so other thing. I'll just reply to that. Um, so one of the things with that is that debugs really kind of isn't maintained at the moment. So people are just kind of committing to stuff as necessary rather than kind of taking a, a leadership sort of thing and saying, OK, the way to go forward is to use a decent revision, revision control system like Darks. And um, I knew that'd be your first choice. <laughs> and um, so I mean, obviously, I'm not doing that because <laughs> Obviously, I'd just use darks and ignore what everyone else in the team wanted. <laughs> and I don't think that would be very nice. Um, I've used darks for the modifications here, or oh, in the second half. Um, yeah, next point. And the second thing was to start to modularize the BTS. Because right now, um, I don't know how many people have actually looked at the Perl code, but some of the CGI scripts and stuff, the uh, stuff that actually reads the logs is duplicated in multiple different places and not particularly well modularized. So I mean, any time that we have a Perl script that's got more than a thousand lines, it's an indication that it's not written ideally. So I mean, if more people could help uh, to modularize, I think Doogie has started on some of it. Uh, there's already stuff to read the log. Uh, one of the patches that I've got actually uses this modularization um, to do that. Uh, and if you wanted to see what it looks like. The, uh, uh, the message that I responded to James Troop has th those patches on it. So bugs.armstrong.com has those if you wanted to check that out. Yeah, but Bidel can just dive out and tackle him, so. Um. OK, so one, one issue that I really would like to see in DevOps, that's um, the ability to subscribe to single bugs to establish some we'll sort of. We'll get to that later. OK. And um, I had another one, and I just forgot it. As distributed revision control stuff has made it easier to work on source code while you're disconnected from the net, 
um, I find myself increasingly becoming annoyed at, at sort of the current state of tools for trying to maintain a local copy of the BTS content that's interesting to me when I'm off the net. Um, I get lots of airplane time that it would be more productive if there were some easier way to sort of maintain a local copy of the state of everything that I care about in the BTS. And it's, of course, defining the everything I care about part that makes the current tools interesting. So the ways that you can, um, you can maintain a local copy of bugs that you're interested in at the moment is basically by downloading the, the bugs for the particular bugs in MBox format. That's kind of pretty awkward. Um, the implementation now at least doesn't completely suck, but um, there are also questions of like, it would be really good to have kind of public mirrors of the bug tracking system. So if the internet stops working, you can just use a different um, URL and still get to the bug tracking system. Um, as I said, that used to work when we had lots of static pages. It doesn't work so well now that we've got CGI's of everything. Um, yeah, that would be really good to do. It's the kind of thing that you can actually kind of implement yourself by just rocking through Merkle to look at the bugs and make an rsync sort of thing available or do something else. Well, one, one aspect of uh, what are the interesting bugs for, for myself would be, um, can I have a list of uh, all the bugs uh, a special package depends from? So, uh, for instance, uh, I'm asking for this, this meta package approach. I would like to know uh, what are the bugs of all the dependency of this package and can I have a list of them? So, one of the things that Debugs tries to do is keep itself relatively limited. Yeah. Um, I'll get onto that a little bit when we talk about the individual bugs descriptions if we've got time later. Um, and one of the things that Debugs doesn't have access to is all the packages information. So it doesn't actually have inf the information on the dependencies. Um, what you could do instead is have, these are the packages I'm interested in. The fact that I'm interested in them because they're dependencies of one that I happen to be particularly interested in and maintaining. Um, Debugs doesn't need to know that. You can. I think actually do that at the moment just by saying packages package equals x comma y comma z comma whatever. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things that you can kind of hack on and do that aren't really documented or very easy to support, easy to realize that you can do it all. So it's uh, currently a documentation problem, and we uh, oh, there are lots of documentation <laughs> problems in <laughs> debugs because I've yeah. worked on it. Okay, thank you. There's a question up there. Um, is something uh, that might be a, a, a bit of a, a feature for the future. Uh, I'd like to attach some sort of regression tests to bugs, so uh, I c uh, so I can uh, uh, so one could uh, automatically test whether a certain bug has reappeared. That, that would be a nice addition, but for the future, I think. Um, so again, one of the things with debugs is it doesn't kind of, it tries to just keep itself limited to tracking stuff. So actually doing the regression test is probably out of its scope. Um, but on the other hand, having the bug tra tracking system store the regression test, so you can do a bug report query, I want the regression test for this particular bug, and then I'll unpack the source and actually do it. That would be in scope. Um, there are similar sorts of things so that at least one of the things that I've been thinking about implementing for a while but haven't gotten around to because I haven't actually paid much attention since the summary format has actually stabilized is um, tracking a bug that's kind of been filed automatically. So one of the things that you really ought to be able to do is file a bug from based on Lintian report and then rather than parsing email responses and stuff, you ought to just be able to say, I filed a bug against this package based on this Lintian report. Tell me the number and show me the bug report and give me the status of it. And that sort of thing might work okay for the, um, I want all the, all the regression, all the things that have, I don't know, I want all the bugs of this particular type and then I want all the regression tests and then I'm going to test them all. So, yeah, I mean, there's stuff like that that's just not implemented and would be quite feasible. If I may just say a quick word about Simon's proposal. Yep. Um, <clears throat> what he's getting at is test-driven development, where if you find a bug, you write a test case that reproduces the bug, and then you fix it, and then you have the test case forever. Now, um, 
I think that is not something that the bug checking system has to do at all. I think that's something that we should possibly start to do, do um, as a policy thing in the packages. I work on the Zopen Plone developer team, and we're starting to do that there. And it proves to be really, it's, it's the only way to scale. And um, yeah, I think that's not a bug tracking thing, but I think it's something that we might want to look into. Um, the way in which it can be a bug tracking system thing is if the regression test doesn't actually come from after you fix the bug, if it comes from before, this is how you duplicate the bug. And it can be useful in that sense because there's no updated package to put it in yet. But yeah, having how many people have regression tests in their package that get run every time it's built? In future, everyone should be putting their hand up to that question. Um, actually, this will be the last question, so there's one up the back there somewhere. I have a feature request and an anti-feature request uh, back on the fake tags part. I've been using that to track uh, all bugs associated with the OSB, which is pretty cool because Wait. generally the bugs need to be against the existing package, but you want another way of looking at them. So um, I like that and, and don't want to see that go away, although right now it's kind of cumbersome because it was set up explicitly for the OSB stuff, and it would be nice to be able to arbitrarily um, create, you know, be able to log into a common de developer machine and arbitrarily create categories for, for tracking bugs. I think right now I have to explicitly log into Spore, which isn't generally available, so maybe that mechanism needs to be moved to uh, um, Merkle or something like that. So I, I, I like that feature, and it's been pretty nice. Yeah, um, well, my, you should talk to me about that so that I feel all inspired to actually make it more general. Okay. Um, my anti-feature request was something you brought up earlier, and that is uh, there are some people who are complaining about the web interface. I actually like the web interface, and, and one thing that I don't want to see happen is that um, I don't like Bugzilla. I think the barrier to entry is too high. Um, every time I'm forced to use Bugzilla, I have to um, go in there, and you have to import, you know, input all sorts of information before you get useful content back out. So, um, you know, anything that is added to the web interface, I want to see it be something that's on the side um, and 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 optional, so that you can uh, use it if you want, but you're not forced to use it like you are with Bugzilla. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So, at least as far as I'm concerned, definitely. Quick. One thing I've uh, sort of wanted a lot of times is uh, structured queries. Things like uh, it was opened less than a month ago. It's severity this and you know multiple. We'll, we'll things. get to the month ago one in a minute. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what uh, what at one point uh, provided that feature was the LDAP backend. Any news on that? No, no. I try to avoid the LDAP stuff. Very successfully, I might add. Okay, so that's break time. Um, I would recommend that you at least skim through the stuff in the proceedings if you've got it handy. Um, if you've got internet stuff, it's on my blog at least. I don't know where else it might be. And we'll resume in about 10 minutes.